So there was recently a huge brand new study from researchers at the University of Texas at Austin, New Chicago, all about the power of random acts of kindness. And this study is called A Little Good Goes an Unexpectedly Long Way, Underestimating the Positive Impact of Kindness on Recipients. Okay, but we all know that acts of kindness are things that make us feel good. But why is this brand new research something we have to pay attention to? So like in the year ahead, acts of kindness people all day long. How come we have to pay attention to this? Definitely. So what the researchers really looked into is why do we not do random acts of kindness? Because what they found is they're actually pretty uncommon. We think that, oh, we just do this. We all know what to do. We don't. Most people do not do random acts of kindness. And it's because we actually don't think it's going to matter to other people. Oh, yeah. And what the researchers found is it does. No matter how tiny, a random act of kindness makes a massive difference for someone else. And you are happier as a result of doing it. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we know that we should be doing this. But what you're saying is that we don't do this. And this is where the insight comes in. Yes. Is that we assume it's not going to matter. Exactly. And a random act of kindness, it's like the littlest thing. Yeah. Smiling at somebody, mm -hmm. putting your arm around somebody, waving yeah. somebody into traffic. Yeah. Um, you know, even tipping yes. somebody that's Huge making one. your coffee and looking at them and saying thank you. Mm hmm. These are all small things that make a difference. And we think it doesn't make a difference. And so I think that's where the learning is, at least for me. Yeah, definitely. Is that you're not doing it not because you don't think it, it, it's an important thing to do. You're not doing it because you don't think it matters. Yes, exactly. And the New York Times picked up this brand new study, ran a huge article on it. And there were thousands of comments of people sharing their stories of random acts of kindness. And it's a reminder that these do matter to people. And here's the interesting twist about the story. And it's why Tracy was so excited to talk about this particular piece of research. The stories were not from people who were like, oh, I started to pay a for it forward chain. No. Which, by the way, you know how everybody starts doing the pay it forward chains yeah. typically around the holidays where you're going to buy the coffee for the person behind mm -hmm. you? I saw this interesting post by somebody who used to be a barista who says that is a complete nightmare for operations because it gets confusing whose drink is whose and what got paid for and people don't know how to grab the drink. Mm -hmm. And that if you want to do something nice in a super busy coffee shop, look at the person making the coffee, mm -hmm. tell them thank you and how much you appreciate them and give that minimum wage person yeah. a tip that is the cost of a cup of coffee that you would have bought for the stranger mm -hmm. behind you. Uh, which I thought was really interesting. But, yeah. but this piece of research, which really impacted me is all of the comments were not about people bragging yeah. about their acts of kindness. It was people sharing stories yeah. about how an act of kindness from a stranger or a teacher or somebody in their life yeah. changed the trajectory of their life. Their entire life. Yeah. Why don't you read that one comment that had us all just get goosebumps? Yeah, definitely. So this is a comment that was within the article. The comment said, as a child, I lived in absolute poverty with an abusive parent. I had a music teacher who one day stopped me while walking down the hall and simply said, are you okay? I broke down. He took me to his office, fed me his lunch and allowed me the space to pull myself together. He told me you're in a bad spot, but it doesn't have to be your life. That small gesture gave me the hope to believe in myself and allowed me to start considering a future where the cycle of abuse and poverty don't exist. 30 years later, he was right and the cycles have been broken. That small moment changed my life, it changed my partner's life, and it changed my children's lives. I want you to take a minute and I want you to think about a moment, yeah. an act of kindness, that somebody else did for you that was meaningful. And when you think about it from being on the recipient's end, from you being the one, even if it's just as simple as like you were running super late for something and traffic was monstrous and a stranger waved you in with yeah. a smile, how that makes your energy shift. Mm-hmm. 
That's what I want you to think about when it comes to this brand new research. Less gym time, same results. I'm down. Less gym time, same results. Let's go, people. Brand what do we do? new big study from researchers at Edith Cowan University in Australia, along with whole research teams in Japan and Brazil. Listen to this. All you need to do to build your strength is do what's called the eccentric muscle contraction, a.k.a. the second half of any exercise. Okay, I don't know what so, you're talking about. Imagine that you were standing up uh -huh. to sit down in your chair or to squat. Okay. It's simply the motion of the sitting down part, not the standing up. Okay, so let me see if I'm getting this right. So are you basically saying that so many of us are losing the benefit of certain things we do all day long? Like for me, plopping into a chair. Yes. I it, let gravity do the work. I it, do not consider sitting in a chair exercise. Are you telling me that this study says that I can consciously sit in a chair differently and I will be exercising? Yes. It says that one muscle contraction in this downward movement for just three seconds a day can increase muscle strength if you do it each day. <laughs> what? Well, okay, so you're not even necessarily talking about how, like, if you're doing bicep curls, you know how people are like, you got to slow down and not just flump the, the weight down. And that down. is true. And that in the research, they did use bicep curls to say people who just did the downward and then put their weights down and then maybe they just got them back up, but it wasn't part of the motion. Yep. Yes. In exercise, they're saying you can cut your routine in half by just doing the second half of each exercise but you can apply this in your life Wow! for passive exercise. Okay, I'm down with passive exercise. I remember when my mom found this revolutionary way of exercising where you literally lay on a table and they <laughs> strap your feet into things and they lift your legs for you. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not exercise, but if it works for you and it gets you there, great. But so I'm gonna unpack this because there's two benefits yeah. to this. Passive exercise, everybody. What was the fancy word? Eccentric. Eccentric. So. When I, it's true, when I do strength training, I focus on lifting up the weight. I don't get intentional about resisting it dropping down. And the lifting up doesn't seem to matter that much, according to the research. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Now let's do the chair thing. So I want to try this. So I'm standing up. Okay. <clears throat> and normally, when I go to sit down, I just like plop down. Yeah. You just went right into yeah, the chair gravity right now. did the work yeah and the chair took the beating yes, yes. okay so now i'm going to stand up and i'm going to you are slowly slowly oh slowly okay, like slowly 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 going God. down okay now my shins are engaged. great and now i'm holding you're holding down for one so i don't leave three don't and leak. also this is like an ab exercise my butt is like an inch above the chair and this is like a squat if you oh the research is saying if you can once per day for three seconds slowly chair sit you have just exercised building your muscles i'm doing this could be easier than a whole weight training new year's resolution my life has just been changed by passive exercise research ladies and gentlemen tracy genius <laughs> thank you so this study when i first read it i was a little bit floored by it so this floored is a, in the this is stupid or floored because there's a some mix there's it, some it felt research stupid and i cannot believe how big of an impact and how big this study is for what it is, but I think this is a very simple thing that anyone can do for one second each day. Wait, one second. One second. Well, you know, I think five seconds can change somebody. Five you are seconds. taking it down, Tracy. This one thing is going to give you an improvement in mental well being for eight hours. And it works in healthy people, it works in those with depression, it works in those with all different kinds of mental health challenges. Here is the study. This was a huge study in the UK at King's College London, huge, reputable research university that was published in scientific reports. Can I just stop you? Yeah. Because I'm trying to think of what this is. Okay. One I don't second, think you're going to get it hour? right. Orgasm? No. No? Okay. No. I can't think of anything else. So this study took place across a four-year span. They collected data of 20,000 assessments, and they had global participants in the study. And do you know what they found, Mel? That would improve my life for eight hours after just doing this for one second. No. 
The study is called Feeling Chirpy. So in this study, what's really interesting, too, is you might think, okay, you're out in nature. That's the benefit. But no, they isolated. It is not about trees. It is not about plants. It is not about being by the water. It works if you listen on an app. Really? There is something about the sound of birds. You can go on YouTube. You can listen to a bird song app. You could get outside. But that deeply resonates with us even at a subconscious level, for eight hours of improved mental well-being up to up to eight hours. That's incredible. You know, it reminds me, um, up here in uh, Vermont, when my in-laws owned this house, there was a clock that used to hang in the kitchen. And every single hour was the photo of a different bird. Mm-hmm. And when the clock would hit the hour, the chirping of the bird would happen. And it didn't matter how many people were in the kitchen. Mm-hmm everybody would stop and turn toward the clock. Mm -hmm. And so on some level, this seems like one of those studies where you're like, honestly, who the hell even got this idea to start this? (laughs) You know, like, but if they've got more than 26,000 assessments. Mm -hmm. Over four years. Over four years, there's something here. And I just, I just wonder because I wonder if this has to do with evolution and the fact that if you think about our ancestors truly navigating and migrating and following patterns of nature yeah. and wind and stars and the migratory patterns of birds. Yeah. That I wonder if there is this connection. And, you know, I, I agree. I, I I love the sound of birds, except for a crow. I don't like no. a crow. But <laughs> if I if I hear a songbird chirping, yeah. It does cause a lift in mood yeah that's incredible wow so now i'm sitting down mindfully i'm listening for birds yeah just to put it on youtube after your episode of the mel robbins podcast maybe we should just play some birds right now. let's play the bird sound okay there is a huge brand new like just published study from georgetown medical center published in the jama psychiatry journal which is a really big prestigious journal so this research is legit My dad used to get that. The journal, I think it's of American Medical Association. Probably. I can't believe that. So this is legit. They compared in people who have anxiety, taking Lexapro versus doing mindfulness-based stress reduction, which often looks like a body scan or gratitude journaling. Now, by body scan, you don't mean climbing into an MRI. No, I mean, how is my body feeling right now? So a lot of times in yoga, um, they'll use this relaxation technique mm-hmm. in a class where you're yeah. like, you know, scrunch up your feet, relax them, scrunch your ankles, relax yes. them, you know, like uh, flex your quads, relax them. That's sort of a way to kind of body yes. scan. So that's one example. What's another example they use? Gratitude journaling. Really? Yes. That's a powerful example of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Okay. So they studied Lexapro. Yes. And then they also studied these mindfulness techniques that bring you into your body and into the moment. Yes. And there are a number of them, but those are just two to highlight is the yep. gratitude journaling. And what they found is the drop in anxiety was equal between Lexapro and just doing these deliberate mindfulness-based stress reduction practices like a gratitude journal. Wow. I yeah. think I have a hunch for why that why? might be. Well, because as somebody who has dealt with and felt anxiety for almost my entire life. I mean, I have it under control now and I profoundly understand it. So I'm I'm annoyed by it, but I'm not scared by it anymore. Um, What's interesting is that anxiety, as we know, is an alarm. Mm -hmm. And anxiety is signaling that something's up and you need some reassurance. And anxiety also typically takes you immediately into the future that something bad's about to happen if you're having if you're directing your mind to pick up a pen and to start writing what you're grateful for you're activating a part of your mind that's different from the part of the mind that takes over when you're anxious Mm -hmm. and so it's a way for you to almost like shortcut yeah in your own mind this this skill of pulling yourself into the present moment. And if you are having a panic attack or you're anxious, you're not in the present moment. 
Exactly. And so this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. And the research, you know, still emphasizes that there's a need for medication and for practices, but in conjunction can have a really, really powerful effect, especially in how your brain actually changes what areas are active. Well, and the other thing that I've found personally and that we know based on the research is that the more that you practice these strategies, whether it's uh, doing a body scan of your own body in the moment, whether it's gratitude journaling, whether it's certain forms of breathing, yeah. whether it is um, redirecting your thoughts. Uh, the other exercise we talk about a lot is the five senses, where in a moment where you feel anxious, you say, well, what can I smell right now? Yeah. What do I see in front of me? And by describing those five senses, again, you are interrupting that part of the brain from taking yeah. over, signaled by the alarm, and you pull yourself into the present. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, definitely. But it's I awesome. love knowing. Why do I love knowing? That researchers at Yale have confirmed that, because a lot of this is common sense. Not a lot of it is common sense, but I think there's something about knowing your time spent in your gratitude journal is worth it. That it matters. It matters. It really does. Yeah. So, a big study from UPenn in Michigan looked at twenty thousand high schoolers as they studied for and took the SAT exam. Okay. What they found, taking into account socioeconomic status, all of their prior achievements throughout high school even. What matters the most for their study plan and their scores is if they didn't rely on willpower and set themselves up with strategies to better be able to study. So you're saying if the students didn't do what I did or didn't do what I see my kids doing, which is basically you got the laptop open, you got the phone yes. on, you got piles of books all around you, and you're just going to try to plow through it. Yes. If instead you get deliberate about chunking it out, putting the phone to the side, yeah. having deliberate blocks of time to study that mm -hmm. you're going to do better on the test. Yeah. In Why? particular, the ones they mentioned was disabling your cell phone. Okay. So turn the phone off. If you're serious about performing better. Yes. You got to turn the phone off when you're preparing. Okay, that's number one. Setting up a distraction-free place to get your work done. Setting up a distraction-free place. I'm I'm starting to smile, Trace, because yesterday Tracy and I were going over the final draft to our <laughs> newsletter that goes out twice a week. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just go to melrobbins.com to sign up for it. And <laughs> Tracy was trying to get me to focus. Mel was doing some online shopping That's while right. <laughs> writing the newsletter to you guys, two tabs open. And so Tracy was so awesome. She, without skipping a beat, you didn't even look at me. You just reached your hand over and shut the the laptop and then shoved it away from me. I you did. You did what the study is telling. And do you yeah. know how quickly we wrapped up the final of it? Yeah, we focused right in and an awesome newsletter went out. Totally. Yeah. And then the other strategy as well, in addition to distraction free and disabling your cell phone is creating a schedule to study. So take a look at the week. If you've yeah. got a big project or you got something and schedule in blocks of time where you're going to go to that distraction free thing and you're going to turn off your cell phone. And that if you were to do that, did they find anything about how it also took less time? Or just that you were more effective, whatever time more you effective. put in. Yes. And one thing they found that did not work was when people said that they willed themselves to study. Mm. Willpower did not lead to results because willpower fades. We can't rely on willpower. And while this is about the SAT, you could probably generalize these results for anything where high performance or studying or preparation is needed. So are you suggesting that sitting on the couch with Netflix on and my laptop open <laughs> yes. is not a good way to research podcast episodes. Probably, depending on how long you want it to take, if you want to study more efficiently, faster, and just perform better, yeah. Put your phone on Do Not Disturb. Go into your other room. Shut the laptop. Shut the laptop. And also look at your calendar in the morning and say, what am I going to get done today? Awesome. Simple strategies lead to a huge result. And again, like I think that these are the things that in the back of your mind, we kind of go, duh. Yeah. But having these validated studies, 20,000 high school students, yeah. like why wouldn't you do this unless you just want to shoot yourself in the foot and make life harder? 
Yeah. Okay, cool. What else you got? Great. So now we have number six. This is a really interesting study that once you hear it, you're going to resonate with this in your own life. Get ready. It is science hour. We've got brand new research, everybody. 